Good evening from Pine Grove Missionary Baptist Church of Linside, West Virginia. I welcome you to our evening service in the name of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. May God bless you and your family. Uh, let's begin our service by praying together. If you would, let's pray. Fathers, we come to you in prayer. I thank you, Father, for once again for this day, for the gift of life today. I thank you, Father, for meeting our needs according to your riches and glory, for blessing us in such a way that you have. Father, thank you for health and prosperity. Most of all, I thank you for salvation. Father, thank you so much for your son, Jesus Christ, that's willing to pay my sin debt, the sin debt of all of mankind, all humanity, for all those who will receive it, uh, believe on it, accept it for themselves. Father, you promised us that you would save us. And Father, I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful, Father, for your saving grace today. Father, just thank you for this time that we can expound upon your word. I pray, Father, the Holy Spirit will speak through me. I pray, Father, that your word will go out and touch someone. It'll draw people unto you, that it'll bless those that need blessed, that it'll also challenge uh, many listeners. I pray, Father, for being anyone that hears this, Father, that's never invited Christ into their heart, into their life, and accepted him as Lord and Savior, that they will be compelled and, and be drawn unto you, and they'll submit yourself they'll be humbly humble enough father to admit their sinful condition or lost condition and know and realize they need to be saved and they can receive eternal life where they're at father just be with us everything father that uh, comes for this good father will give you all the praise honor and glory have your way now in jesus name i pray amen <clears throat> The title of the message this evening is See the Scars, See the Scars. God gave me this thought days ago. Many or most people are living a very upbeat lifestyle. The times that we're in on most part is very busy, busy, busy. We're on the go. There's all kinds of things to do. We got this to do. We got that to do. And next thing you know, we turn around and we say, where has our time gone? Where has it went? That's the society that we live in. When you think about, uh, I do look back at times growing up, things were simple. We didn't have all these things we've got today. We've got, uh, didn't barely have a lawnmower back in the day, an old push mower. And if you was lucky enough to have a little riding lawn tractor, you thought you was something. It didn't have about a 22-inch cut and uh, didn't have weed eaters, had uh, sickles and mowing size. And uh, now we got lawnmowers, you can mow at 35 mile an hour and mow about 72 inches while you're at it. So I mean, we got weed eaters, we've got all these things. Uh, automobiles you know, used to be in the day other than hot rod cars. If you got up to 60 mile an hour, you know, you thought you was something and now that is nothing. So, uh, you know, we've come a long ways with what man has come up with that you know washing machines you don't have to carry water you don't have to use the old uh washing board uh we grew up with the old ringer type washer and you run them through and you run them back through and you didn't get your arm run up in it that was a good thing so we've come a long ways that things should be much quicker we ought to have more time amen we should have all the time in the world we got microwaves we got electric stoves and gas stoves and air condition i mean we've just we're living it up but yet we don't have time for our neighbor we don't have time to worship the lord we don't have time to go to church we don't have time to go visit and spread the gospel we don't have time to go door to door something wrong with the picture isn't it we're too busy satan uses this scheme to keep man too busy too busy, you got too much to do. With a, when a person is lost, Satan will convince that person that is lost that they have all the time in the world to get right. He used that on me, and I listened to him. I did, back when I was a teenager. That's a devil's lie. You can only get saved when the Spirit of God draws you. And we're not guaranteed the next breath are we we're not guaranteed we're we're going to get the next breath much less another day as a believer especially in these times we must keep our eyes and our heart on our savior jesus christ it's so easy to become complacent or have a sense of apathy you just nonchalant just go through the motions 
and that ain't the way it should be. The thought gave me this, uh, gave me this thought, God did, was to keep your eyes on Christ. Keep your eyes on the nail scars. The price that was paid for my salvation. The price that was paid for your salvation, if you're listening and you're a child of God. Our salvation was and is free to man, but it cost God his only begotten son, Jesus Christ. It cost Jesus Christ to leave the portals of heaven. He was in perfection. And he left that to come to earth. He put on the robe of flesh, knowing he was coming here to suffer, to bleed, to die on the cross of Calvary, and then resurrect from the dead that we could be freed from our sin death. Can you imagine knowing what he was going to go through? He knew this. Not only did he have the physical part, but he also knew his father was going to turn his back on him. He was going to be separated from that. Jesus bore sin. He became sin and suffered for it. He was beaten and marred more than any other man. Then he gave up his life for a ransom for many. Amen. That's why he come. That's why he come here. First, Jesus' scars tells us that he knows our pain. You know, we talk about the different things that we go through, and it's uncomfortable and suffering. And we see all kinds of bad things happen to good people, don't we? We see people suffer with cancer and other diseases. We see people uh, really physically just mangled up in accidents and their life taken in, in just terrible ways and a few comes to mind immediately, but I'm not going to mention those. And you think, oh, how terrible that is. How gruesome that that was. And oh, what kind of pain that person suffered. And yet Jesus Christ, the Son of God, went through a whole lot more, amen. And he didn't deserve it. And he did it for you and you and me. You know, when you think about that, he came, he put on a robe of flesh and bones. He felt every bit of the pain that if it had been you or it had been me. In Hebrews chapter 2, verse 17, the scripture says, Wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make reconciliation for the sins of his people. He was made in our likeness with uh, flesh and bones and feelings you know a lot of people think well jesus never he was a son of god he did he didn't feel that oh yes he did have you really thought about that i've sat tried to imagine that i can't imagine the pain and the suffering of them driving those nails through his hands and his feet or anybody else and he didn't fight it he didn't fuss and he didn't cuss and he didn't swarp he laid down and said, there it is. Not to mention all the suffering in the night, the beating and the scourging, blindfolded and hit from all, all directions, spit upon. And he put the crown of thorns, and if you look at the realistic part of that, I've seen some thorns that actually come from overseas and they're not little briars my friend they're thorns and they're huge and they're long and they're sharp to have that woven and set up on your head and it sinking through your skin and your brows and not only did they do that then they took a reed which is nothing but a wooden pole and would smack it then beat it down up on his head yes he felt every bit of that the cat of nine tails as it ripped the meat from his back. Jesus became one of us. He knows human pain. He would suffer with us. He would suffer for us. Listen. He took upon him your sins and my sins. Amen. And he died in our place. That's what we deserve. The testimony of our sister with what she said. She don't deserve salvation no she didn't and neither do i neither do you jesus took that suffering he took it upon himself you know the old saying he took one for the team amen he did he took mine 
and he took yours. Yes, he felt the pain. Because of God's love for us, Jesus willingly done this. Romans 5, 8, But God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That was many years ago, but he died for me. He knew I was going to need it. He knew you was going to need salvation while we were yet sinners. You know, we was mentioning earlier, God loved us way before we knew him, before we loved him, amen. If you would, if you want to turn to Matthew chapter 27, and I'm going to read a couple verses. I've got a couple different verses here, but if you'd like to follow along just on these two, feel free to do so. Matthew chapter 27, verses 33 and 35. You're familiar with these verses. Just uh, bringing out a couple words here, then we'll go on to some other scripture readings. Matthew chapter 27, verse 33 reads, And when they were coming to a place called Golgotha, that is to say, a place of a skull, they gave him vinegar to drink mingled with gall, and when he had tasted thereof, he would not drink. Here's the thing to think about. Look at what happened on verse 35, third word over. And they crucified him and parted his garments, casting lots that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet. If you read and study about the act of crucifixion, the process of the human body being nailed to a cross and left there until death occurred. When you read into that and you study it, how gruesome it is, and when you find out the suffering and the suffocation and the pain and the agony as the person hanging there is suffocating or gasping for breath or gasping for air, so their legs is nailed and their hands is nailed and they, they're, they're stretched out so you don't really have much strength in the way of the arms and so your body's pulling down on your shoulders and your back and it's causing your uh, abdomen to collapse and you can't breathe so then you're going to try to push yourself up so you can breathe and then all the pain and the agony from the nails and the weight upon your feet and your suffering, you're, you're bleeding out. When you read and study that, it almost makes you sick. I've got a copy of it. We've read some of it here before, and I took it to work and, and had the guys to read it, and it's like, I don't want to read that no more. It is just, it's, it's gruesome. It's nasty. It's suffering. One of the most miserable deaths ever devised. Jesus wasn't the only person crucified, but was the only perfect innocent sinless human being ever crucified amen and my friend he did that for me he did that for you why did he love me enough to do that guess who put him on the cross i did people say well the romans did no i did it's my fault because listen if you was the only one he did it for just you amen disciples and others witnessed jesus hanging there on that cross they also witnessed jesus being uh dying there on the cross in matthew 27 50 jesus when he had cried again with a loud voice yielded up the ghost they didn't kill him he gave up the ghost he could have come off the cross he could have come down off the cross if he would have chose to but he came here to pay my sin debt and your sin debt it wasn't the nails that held him to the cross. It was his love and compassion for you and I. We know they took his body down and it was buried in a borrowed tomb. Now think about it in a moment, just for a minute. Think about the nail-scarred hands. The price that was paid that we could be debt-free, sin debt-free. Jesus become flesh. Jesus felt and took our pain and suffering. On that resurrection morning, Jesus received a glorified body. If you would, turn to Luke chapter 24, verse 36. Luke chapter 24, beginning with verse 36. The Bible reads in Luke 24, verse 36, And as they thus spake, 
Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. But they were terrified and affrighted and supposed that they had seen a spirit. And he said unto them, Why are you troubled? And why do thoughts arise in your thoughts? Those are questions to them. Behold, my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit hath not flesh and bones as ye see me have. And when he had thus spoken, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they yet believed not for joy and wondered, he said unto them, Have ye any meat? Have ye here any meat? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish and of honeycomb, and he took it and did eat before him. And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. If you think about what he's saying here, the nail-scarred hands told the story, didn't it? Do you recognize me? Look. Look at my hands. Look at my feet. I'm not, I'm not a spirit. I'm Jesus. The nail-scarred hands told the story of a risen Savior. They had seen him on the cross. They had seen his body taken down. They knew it had been wrapped and, and, and been put in the tomb. But now here he is. He said, here, look. Why do you question this? I told you this before I left. There is life after death. There is remission for our sin. There is eternal hope and glory. Amen. What a story the resurrected, nail-scarred hands of Jesus speaks to us even today. Amen. If they had went to that tomb and that body would have been there, there would have been no hope for us. Amen. That gives us, that assures us of our hope, assures us of the resurrection, assures us of eternal life. Amen. The Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 42, so also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. We can understand the resurrection. We're, we're sown in corruption, but we're going to be rose. We're going to be raised in incorruption. Amen. Have you ever looked at the nail-scarred hands? Do you believe in the nail-scarred hands? Well, my friend, if you don't, you're lost. Do you doubt the resurrected scarred hands? You know, there's many that are skeptics. They don't believe, do they? They don't believe this. They don't believe the gospel. But you know what? The Apostle Thomas, he doubted, didn't he? If you would turn to, uh, with me to John chapter 20, verse 24. John chapter 20, verse 24. We'll look at 24 through 29, I think it is. You think about the apostles, they had been under the sound doctrine of his teaching. They had seen his miracles. They had walked with him. They had eaten with him. They had slept with him. They had been through all the, the miracles that he'd done. He had given them power to, to heal and to do all these things. He told them all these things was to come to pass. So you would think, oh, yeah, they should understand Look at verse 24. But Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. He had already appeared to the other apostles, and Didymus wasn't there. So now this is another, another time that uh, Jesus appears before him. The other disciples therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord. But he said unto them, Except I shall see his hands the print of the nails, and put my finger in the print of the nails, and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. Jesus told them, they said, hey, we, we've seen Jesus. Then he says, well, I'll tell you one thing, unless I can put my finger in that hole, and I can stick my hand in that riven side, I don't believe a word you're telling me. That is just, you're just kidding. They ain't, it can't be. I will not believe. Verse 26, and after eight days again, his disciples were within and Thomas with them. And guess what? And came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Peace be unto you. Now look, 
the doors were shut. Did it say he opened the door and come through the door? Did it? Jesus could do what he wanted to do. He come through the wall. He can do what he wants to. He's in a glorified body. So he come in. Verse 27, then saith he to Thomas, now don't you know Jesus knew Thomas was doubting and didn't believe? Well, sure he did. He says, okay, okay. I'm going to give you your chance to believe. So here he said to, to Thomas, here, reach hither thy finger and behold my hands. Here, reach hither thy hand and thrust it into my side and be not faithless but believing. Here you go. If that's what it's going to take for you to believe who I am and what I've done. Here, come on over here and stick your fingers in here. Come on, stick your hand in here. Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord, my God, my Lord, my God. Jesus saith unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. Yes, it took a little more for Thomas, didn't it? But nevertheless, he come about, didn't he? We're even more blessed because we can't see, but we believe by faith as God gives us the strength. Listen, my friend, are you trusting in the nail-scarred hands of Jesus this evening? You know, we want to trust him for salvation, but we struggle sometimes trusting him with many other things in our life, don't we? Are you a believer of the life, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ? Do you realize that some people can believe parts of it, but not all of it? How sad it is. You can't pick out the parts that you want to believe in this Slide out the things that you don't want to leave. You can't do that. It's all or nothing, amen? amen? All or nothing. You know, there's a song. I started to bring it and play it. The only scars in heaven is going to be the nail-scarred hands. Amen. We're all scarred. We have physical scars. We have emotional scars. We have all kinds of scars and problems in this life. But there's not going to be one of them in heaven, Amen. The only scars that's going to be in heaven is going to be those nail-scarred hands. Do you think we're going to get to see those? Amen. You're going to look and say, I know who that is. There he is. That's my Savior. That's my Lord. I put them nails there. I put the scars there. It was me. It was me. As a child of God, are you looking forward to seeing those nail-scarred hands? Listen, these things in this life that we long for, when we got children and grandchildren and dreams and ideas and goals and stuff like that, we hope to live and to see things happen. We want to see good things happen in our families and in our community and in our country and in the world and for our kids and our grandkids, and that's good. We should. But what's going to be better than all that is when you see him nail-scarred hands. All the evil's behind. All the sin is gone. All the suffering is gone. All the dying and the crying. Are you looking forward to seeing the nail-scarred hands? As a child of God, are you looking forward to that? Have you ever accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as your own Savior? If you're listening and you've never done that, if not, why not right now? What are you waiting on? What are you waiting on? What is it that's in this life and in this world that is so grandeur, it's so wonderful, that you would rather turn Christ away and die and go to hell, a crisis eternity? How much are you being bought off from? What is Satan paying? What is he entertaining you with? What is it in this world that's so important that you don't want to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ except a free gift of salvation and live a much better life than you've ever lived? What is it that's so entertaining? What's this world got to offer that's so great? What is it? Is it worth it to you? Do you realize that you're a sinner and that you're at odds with God? 
You know, that's the first step. You've got to realize that something's amiss in your life, that you're not okay. You're not okay before God. Even though you're a great person, you're a generous person, and you're not potty mouth, and you do good things, and you're honest and good report, and it's good to be all those things, and you should, but you're still a sinner. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. I reflect on the fact, and I've said this many times, you've probably heard me say it from the pulpit, when my life was changed when I realized my lost condition. When I stood there amiss because I was hurting because of a loss of a friend, a, a dear friend and close friend, and I realized my lost condition. My whole priority system changed just like that. I realized I wasn't right with God. Nobody told me. Nobody preached a sermon. I wasn't in a church, but I realized I was lost. Romans 6, 23 says, For the wages of sin or the penalty or the payment for sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. There's a penalty for that sin. You're separated. You're going to die physically. You're going to die spiritually. You're dead spiritually. I didn't want to die and go to hell. I was in a work. At that point, I'm like, I got to do something. I got to do something. I don't know what I got to do, but I don't want to die and go to hell. I don't want to. I don't want to be like this no more. I don't want to be like this no more. I might be next. I don't want to go there. I don't want to go. I need to be saved. I don't know how to do this, but I've got to get off this road. Romans 10 and 9 said that if thou wilt confess with the mouth the Lord Jesus and shall believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. I knew there was a Jesus. I believed that. I believed there was a heaven. I believed there was a hell. But you know what? I thought I was too good to go to hell. I was a good old boy. I'm not that bad. Well, heck, there's a lot more people in this community worse than me. And some of them go to church. But you know what? I was wrong before God. How about you, my friend? Can you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ? Can you, can you confess that with your mouth? you believe it with your heart and confess it with your mouth? He, he did these things. He died on the cross for you. And then he arose from the dead. Verse 10 says, For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. you got to believe it with all your being, don't you? It ain't just knowing it, it's trusting it. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. This is what had to happen to me to be saved. It's what you have to do. Acts chapter 4 and verse 12 says, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. There's no other way to be saved but through Jesus Christ. Those nail-scarred hands. The nail-scarred hands fits everybody. Amen. Respond to God while he may be found. If he's troubling you, listener, he's dealing with you, he's calling you out just like he did me that day. Don't turn it away. You may never get another chance. If you're a listener and you're a child of God, maybe you're depressed right now over something. Maybe you're overwhelmed with worldly issues, the stress of life, finances, health issues. You're looking, are you looking forward to the nail-scarred hands? You know there's a lot of people depressed right now. There's a lot of people doing things because they cannot deal with life right now. This is real, folks. It's real and it's even real for children of God because Satan wants to wear us out. He wants to take us down. The stress of life, the issues you deal with in society, wickedness and evils all around, and it's kicking up speed. But listen, brother or sister in Christ, our Lord will see us through. He feels your pain. He knows your pain. He knows every temptation that you and I are faced with. He was tempted just the same. You'll say, oh, no. He wasn't faced with what we've got today. 
the sin is a sin, the temptation is a temptation. Satan just decorates it a little different for the times. It's the same thing. Listen, brother or sister in Christ, look up. Look up. Be of good cheer. Redemption draweth nigh. We're probably not going to be here much longer. Amen. Amen. Look up and know that God is good. Go back and look at the nail-scarred hands. I want you to think about this message in your everyday life. I thought about this this past week with many things going on in my life. And God gave me this thought and this message. Look at the nail-scarred hands, son. Look at the nail-scarred hands. I've got this. I've got you. I bought you. I've paid your price. You belong to me. I've got you. Trust in me. Keep your eyes on those nail-scarred hands. Look up and know that God is good. Amen. Till next time, goodbye and God bless.